Before I formally introduce the Don today, I would like to take this moment to thank Terry Walsh, Cisco Canada, for sponsoring today's event. Thank you, Terry. Cisco is the charter sponsor with other leading Canadian companies of an eight-city speaking tour across Canada. I would also like to welcome two tables of students to today's lunch. They are from Humber College, sponsored by Ernst & Young, and Marshall McLuhan Catholic Secondary School, sponsored by BMO Financial Group. Students, would you please stand so we can recognize you. And now I would like to introduce today's special guest. The internet has fundamentally changed the way we work, live, and play. It has transformed our businesses and has rapidly globalized our economy in a way that was unimaginable just 10 years ago. It has transformed our world by making information instantly available. No longer do we have to wait for tomorrow's newspaper to find out what is going on across the globe. No longer do we need to wait in line at a bank to get money or pay our bills. And no longer do we have to rely on the postal system to stay in contact with friends and relatives. This information can be assessed with a click of a mouse or the tap of a finger. But today's internet, often referred to as Web 2.0, is bringing people together like never before. Thanks to the new web, encyclopedias, Jetliners, operating systems, mutual funds, and much else are being created by teams numbering in the thousands or even millions. And websites like Flickr, MySpace, and Second Life are enabling peers to collaborate across time and space to create value that otherwise would never have existed. And while this may be scary to some of us raised in the Atari or pre-Atari generations, it also raises tremendously exciting possibilities for society, and in particular, for solving some of the biggest challenges facing the world today. Don Tapscott is a thought leader in this dynamic, collaborative, web-based world. And I'm very excited that he's with us today to share his insights into the phenomenon of Web 2.0, mass collaboration. And I'm hoping he'll tell me what a wiki is. All kidding aside, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to our podium today one of the savviest people in the world when it comes to the new web, the chief executive of New Paradigm, Mr. Don Tapscott. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction, and thanks to the, uh, the Canadian Club for holding this uh, magnificent lunch. Also, uh, Terry Walsh uh, from Cisco, thank you for sponsoring the lunch. And, um, and I'm also in, in gratitude to the head table for having come out here today. I'd like to uh, uh, center out Gord Nixon in particular, who uh, gave a jacket quote for the book and uh, who I've been able to drag out at, at uh, several events to uh, get this book launched. And uh, there, there are, uh, 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 there's also a long list of other people I could uh, acknowledge uh, in the room, but I would like to uh, just pick on uh, one, uh, which is my mom, Mary Tapscott. Thank you, Mom. <clears throat> it took a while, Mom, but I turned out okay. <laughs> well, congratulations to each of you. You have been chosen as the Time Magazine Person of the Year. <laughs> As the online collaborator, you're the person of the year, and, you, and you've been up to a lot uh, over the last year. But as Anthony Williams, uh, my co-author, would say, that was so 2006. <laughs> There's something uh, big that's happening here. On February the 4th, viewers of the Super Bowl will see an ad on the Super Bowl from Frito-Lay that was created by one of its customers as part of an online contest and that was chosen by you once again. In fact, after this uh, lunch is over, go back to your office or home or whatever and vote for which of the top five ads you think is the best. And when this ad is broadcast, it will be the most anticipated ad in the history of the Super Bowl, and maybe ever. Between now and February the 4th, uh, a lot of things will happen. First of all, MySpace, the online community, will grow at 375,000 new registrants per day. 
Wikipedia, an online encyclopedia owned by no one, developed by millions, with quality as good as Britannica, according to recent studies, will grow to be about 12 times bigger than Britannica, and it'll probably get translated into another language or two. It's now in dozens. On the virtual community, my, uh, sorry, Second Life, there'll probably be a couple more Second Life millionaires. This is where you, or more precisely your avatar, can go and have a Second Life. And you can buy and sell things and have a country property on the lake. And uh, this is all done with Second Life money, but because that's pegged to the U.S. dollar as a floating currency, this is now real money, and there are real U.S. dollar millionaires as a result of their activity in the Second Life uh, world. And between now and February the 4th, every second, 24 hours a day, there'll be a new blog created. Now, some of these don't exactly have a huge audience, but some of them have an audience of eight or 900,000 people, which means they rival today's uh, modern newspapers and television channels. If Bob Dylan were commenting, he might say, there's something going on here, and you don't know what it is. What is going on? And where is this headed? And what, what, what's a business manager to do about it? Well, this is really the topic that uh, we tackled uh, in, in our research. The easy answer to all of this is to be, would be to write it off as another bubble. Big mistake. You see, throughout human history, whenever you have a big innovation, electrical power, internal combustion engine, uh, the telephone, radio, television, whatever, these innovations all followed a similar pattern. First you had experimentation and then some activity and then you had a period of investment and excitement and speculation and this led to a bubble and the bubble burst. And then what happened, everybody got depressed, and then we moved into a period of decades of long-term deployment where the real impact of the innovation was understood on business models, on the economy and on society and that's what's happening today with the internet. We've had our bubble. And smart managers are beginning to understand that this is not about dot-coms or websites or eyeballs. What we're moving into is the early days of a huge change in the corporation. And in the way that we orchestrate capability, the way that we innovate, the way that we create goods and services in, in society, the way that we mine for gold, and build aircraft or discover new medicines and drugs. So what, what's going on here? Why is all this happening? Let me talk about four big drivers. First, technology. Noella mentioned the new web. This ain't your daddy's internet that we have today. It's a broadband, ubiquitous, connected by all kinds of devices. I'm sure many of you have Blackberries in here, and I'll be looking for that Blackberry prayer. You know, during my talk, and people reverently looking into their laps while I'm speaking. Um, I have a friend in Toronto, everything in his house that has electrical power has an IP address. That means it's connected to the internet and all this stuff talks to itself. I have no idea what his toaster says to his refrigerator, but um, he, was, he was telling me that his fence talks to his sprinkler and I said, well, why would you care? And he says, well, Don, if a burglar comes over the fence, the sprinkler is my first line of defense. <laughs> so furthermore, the old web was based on a standard, it's the only time I'll get technical on you, called HTML. That was a standard for the presentation of information. That's what the first period of the web was about, websites and presenting information. Now we have a standard called XML that's really turning the web into a giant platform for programmability. The web is becoming a global computer. And every time you go on it, you, the person of the year, are programming the internet. A giant global platform enabling you to self-organize and to create value in all kinds of new ways. It's not just about social networking or about user-generated media. It's new models of value creation. The second big change is a demographic revolution. Any of you who have kids um, under the age of 25 know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is the first generation to grow up digital, and these kids are different. 
I started studying these kids about 10 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all the sophisticated technology. And at first I thought, my children are prodigies. <laughs> and uh, then I noticed that all their friends were like them, the theory that all their friends were prodigies, well, that was you know, a bit of a stretch. <laughs> so I started studying them as a generation. These kids have no fear of technology because it's not technology to them. It's like the air. They've grown up bathed in bits. And they think the Internet's about as fascinating as a refrigerator. And when your daughter is online chatting with her, her friend, your 11-year-old, she's not thinking, boy, uh, this synchronous text-based communication technology is really a disruptive medium. She's thinking what her friend said, right? When your son is downloading an MP3 file, he's not thinking, boy, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing using the MP3 format is really enabling a new you know, whatever. He's thinking, good, I just got Alicia's key, Alicia Keys' new song. This is the first time in human history when children are an authority about something really important. I was an authority on model trains when I was a kid. And your kids are authorities on the big revolution that's changing every institution in society. This has never happened before. The only time we came close was with immigrant kids who learned the language and the 11-year-old at the breakfast table was an authority. But it's never happened as a generalized societal phenomenon. Biggest generation ever is coming into the workforce and the marketplace. And you combine a technology revolution with a demographic revolution of kids that rather than watching TV are interacting and reading and thinking and collaborating and composing their thoughts and authenticating and scrutinizing and organizing information. It's a generation that thinks differently. You combine those two things together and you get the third big factor, which is a social revolution. So if you've not been part of this whole social networking thing, but you do have a teenager or a kid in university, ask them to see Facebook. Facebook is a community that 85% of all university students participate in. They don't use electronic mail. In our research, we ask kids, well, why would you use electronic mail? And they said, well, it's kind of yesterday's technology. I mean, one said electronic mail is really sort of a formal communication technology for sending a thank you note to one of your friend's parents. <laughs> but they're, they're online in these massive communities. And my daughter, uh, Nicole, has 300 of her closest friends in this community. And with their friends, that's another group of 11,000 people that she gets to influence and at her fingertips, she has the most powerful tool ever for finding out, informing others, uh, organizing, communicating, and collaborating. You combine those, technology, demographic, and a social revolution with some changes that are happening in business. And there is something big that's happening here. Throughout the 20th century, we created wealth through this thing called the Vertically Integrated Corporation. It did everything from soup to nuts. And about 75 years ago, there was a Nobel Prize winning economist. His name was Ronald Coase. And he asked a deceptively simple question. He said, why does the firm exist? He says, if Adam Smith is right and an open market's the best mechanism to determine how goods and resources and information and materials and so on, people are organized, why isn't everybody an independent contractor at every step along the way in production? And he said the answer is, and he won a Nobel Prize for saying this, the answer is collaboration costs. The costs of search. This is over 70 years ago. He said the costs of search, of finding all the right people and information and materials and so on to do something. The cost of coordination, of getting them all to work together. And the great industrialists uh, uh, industrialist understood this. Henry Ford, within the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company, had a power plant, a shipping company, a steel mill, a glass factory. Why? Because the costs of collaboration in an open market were way greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company. Well, along comes the Internet. And the first stage, we started to see the Internet dropping collaboration costs. It's not about websites or eyeballs or any of that. 
It's an infrastructure that on a global basis is dropping collaboration costs. And as a result, vertically integrated corporations started to unbundle into focus companies that work within business webs. So um, my wife, Anna, has a, a car. It's, uh, it's called an X3 uh, from BMW. It's not made by BMW. It's made by uh, Magna, a Canadian company that does the final assembly of the vehicle. So companies like Cisco that understood this and developed a networked business model based on collaboration enabled by the web were able to succeed and to grow rapidly and to dominate their respective markets. Now, buckle up. We're ready for the next stage. Collaboration costs are dropping so radically on a global basis that now companies, big or small, and individuals can come together as a mass and create something like an encyclopedia or say an operating system. The Linux operating system is now the dominant computer operating system in the world for medium and large computers. Nobody owns it. It's created by thousands of people who've never met. And they started doing it on a volunteer basis. We used to call them digital Rotarians. Well, if you can create an operating system that way, could you create a mutual fund? It's called marketocracy.com. It turns out that you can create physical goods and services. This is leading to the first category six uh, business storm. This is the perfect storm. Technology, demographics, a social revolution, and an economic revolution. And we became convinced in our research, and we did millions of dollars of research, that the corporation as an institution is going through the biggest change in a century. Buckle up. Now, there are lots of detractors of this whole thing. Uh, many people have said, this is all bad. This is bad for capitalism. You see, when you start having volunteers coming together and creating, say, an encyclopedia or an operating system, this takes away from the legitimate right of companies to make a profit. And companies need to make a profit. Otherwise, we have no R&D and we have no investment and we, and we don't uh, have capitalism as we've known it. And what we concluded in our work was that this view is really badly mistaken that smart companies in industry after industry understand that mass collaboration is this powerful new force that can be harnessed for growth, for competitiveness, and yes, for profit. So let me tell you a story. Uh, is Rob McEwen here, any chance? Rob? Oh. I thought he was gonna come, I was gonna center him out, but picture, if you will, a handsome looking lad. Um, <laughs> Rob was the, um, the CEO of a, a company called Gold Corp. I know him well. He's my neighbor, actually, which is how I found, found out about this story. And he was a banker, found himself taking over a gold mining company. And he asked his geologist, tell me where the gold is and how much gold we've got. And a year later, he concluded, after asking them this question every which way to Sunday, that they didn't know the answer. But it occurred to him, if my geologists don't know the answer, maybe somebody else does. So he did a radical thing. In the gold mining industry, your most secret intellectual property is your geological data. This stuff is kept in safes and high security computer systems. He took his geological data and he published it and organized a contest on the internet called the Gold Corp Challenge. Half a million dollars for anybody who can find gold. He got submissions from all around the world, 77 to be precise. They used techniques he'd never heard of. They came from geologists, but they also came from mathematicians, computer scientists. He was getting organic solutions to inorganic problems. And for his 70, uh, sorry, for his half a million dollars, he selected the top three. For his half a million dollar investment, he found over $3.4 billion worth of gold. And the market value of the company over a period of years went from $19 million to close to $10 billion. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. <laughs> he just did a renovation to his house. <laughs> now that he 
has billions of dollars. No. So what's going on here? You know, conventional wisdom says, here's how, here's how you compete and you create value. You get all the best people and you get them inside the boundaries of your company, right? And, and your human capital, your most precious resource, goes out in the elevator every night. So you need to retain them. And then you create a good environment whereby they can work and innovate, and then they come up with things, and, and, and you, you protect it. And you trademark it, and you patent it, and you keep that uh, information secret, and you sure don't open, uh, open up to the world. He did the opposite of all of that. He viewed the world as being his uh, 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 human resource department, basically. He adopted the four principles of, of, of Wikonomics. He embraced peering not just about hierarchies. We've always created wealth through hierarchies, and hierarchies will be around forever. But he reached outside the boundaries of these hierarchies and found peers of his geologists elsewhere. Secondly, he opened up the boundaries of his corporation. Thirdly, he shared his information. I'm not suggesting you open the kimono and everything, but you can kind of undress for success, if you like, by, um, by sharing important information as appropriate. And the other thing, the old expression, think global, act local, he not only he thought global, but he didn't just act local, he acted globally. And he reached out all around the world. And as a result, he built a very successful company. So where's all this going? Well. That was a summary of chapter one <laughs> of the book. And uh, I'm not going to be able to do the other uh, chapters, especially the last chapter, which we're writing as a wiki. And we'd invite all of you to come and co-create this chapter with you. Uh, it's, we hope it will be the definitive guide to competitiveness in the 21st century. But I will mention with an example these what we call seven wonders of mass collaboration. In, and just a second on each. The first are the peer producers. So I asked Linus Torvald, who is the, uh, the founder of Linux, why do you do this? There's no money in it, really, for the main participants in Linux, although today most of the participants in Linux are there because their company has sent them there to work on it. Why do you do this? And he said, Don, if you were an engineer, you wouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> When I solve a technical problem, the hair stands up on the back of my neck. So for Microsoft, this turned out to be not a positive thing. For IBM, they decided we're going to embrace Linux. They put $90 million a year into the Linux movement, and it saves them a billion dollars a year on developing and maintaining an operating system. You can harness peer production for success, and in doing so, you raise the tide, all boats get lifted, and you compete on a different level. A second is something we call ideagoras. This is an open market for ideas or uniquely qualified minds. So when Procter & Gamble wants to find a mo molecule that will take red wine off a shirt, they don't go to um, their internal R&D department to find it. Because A.G. Laffley, the CEO there, has said, I want half of all our innovations to come from outside the company. So they'll go to an idea agora on the internet. One is called Innocentive. There are 90,000 chemists. And out there is a retired chemist in Toronto or a, a grad student in Taipei who can find that molecule, and P&G will pay them. Opening up the boundaries, and, and, and as a result, P&G, of course, saves millions of dollars, they come to market faster, and today they have 22 brands worth more than a billion dollars. And you ask A.G. Laffley, what's the main uh, driver for our success? He'll tell you, we have a new model of innovation based on mass collaboration. Prosumers, you not only can consume products and services, you can produce them. So in Second Life, um, the two million people that are there in this community are producing the product, the good and service. Lego had a product called the Mindstorm. Kids build robots, but because kids are so smart, they had the code, they created a website, and they started sharing all these applications. So Lego had a choice. It could be like the music industry and decide to sue the children. <laughs> or, 
don't get me going on that one. Um, or it could open up their whole platform, which is what they did today. There are thousands of software engineers between the ages of 65 and 4 uh, developing Mindstorm app applications. Their, cus their consumers produce the product. Fourth, what we call the new Alexandrians. Imagine if the biotech and pharma companies had decided to own each a chunk of the human genome. How not just healthcare, but humanity would have set back, been set back inexorably. They decided, no, we're going to share for science and we're going to have a new science of sharing. And by sharing, we'll create this wonderful asset that will enable all of our businesses to grow and we'll compete on a different level. Five, what we call open platforms. All the world's a stage and you get to be a player. So you're a little mom and pop business. You can now harness the global capability of Amazon.com because Amazon has opened up that business infrastructure, their technology, their payment systems, their shipping systems, and you can go sell your stuff on Amazon. A third of Amazon's revenue today comes from this. How could you open up your business to the rest of the world? You're a car company? Well, a car is not just a way of getting around. It's a place of work and learning and entertainment. And it turns out food, 10% of meals uh, in Canada are eaten in automobiles. So how could you open up those platforms such that you could have, as Amazon does, 200,000 programmers outside the boundaries of Amazon co-creating value for Amazon? I'll bet you get a lot of teenagers that will create some great systems for entertainment or for learning in the car. You don't want them messing with the drivetrain and the steering systems, but those non-mission critical systems. Six, the global plant floor. Boeing, the 787 Dreamliner, was designed in a completely different way. Rather than having a spec and putting that out hierarchically to your supply chain, Boeing said to all its partners, this mind-boggling global ecosystem, we want to co-innovate this aircraft with you, including we're going to design it together and the partners do important things in the plane, like make the engine or the fuselage or the electronics. 787 is a fabulous plane, it's coming to market, it's on time, it's on budget, and it's not just that that's a better way to make an aircraft, it's competitor Airbus, some people speculate, may never come to market. The stakes are becoming very high in understanding these new principles. And finally, the wiki workplace. I, was, I don't know if this is a story out of school, but I was doing an uh, executive briefing at Cisco, and their head of sales and marketing comes up to me and he says, Don, could we wiki our sales playbook? That is, have all of the salespeople develop the sales manual rather than some bureaucrats in head office, he says. He says if they develop it, I, th I would think it'd be better because they're the ones who know how to sell and they're working with the customers. And furthermore, if we create a wiki for the sales playbook, then it's more likely to be followed, wouldn't you think? And of course, he was absolutely right. Cutting across the silos and the boundaries and breaking down many of the old bureaucratic structures of the corporation to enable high performance and to speed up the metabolism of innovation and to enable those uniquely qualified minds that are buried within your company to somehow be brought to bear on innovation and value creation. This is a huge change. And it's a time to me, yes, there's some peril, but it's a time of great excitement and that's very positive. Call it a new age of participation. <laughs> People get to participate in the economy in ways that were previously unthinkable. You can not only read an encyclopedia, you can write one. You can not only watch the evening news, you can produce a news clip on current TV. And if it gets a lot of votes, it's going to be broadcast on the cable network in the United States. You can not only watch a Super Bowl ad, you can try and be the, the, the person that creates one. You're a student in MIT, or sorry, in Mumbai, in India, and you've always wanted to go to MIT. You can't afford it. MIT's opened up its courseware. And when you learn at MIT how to be a great programmer, you can join a group of 100,000 programmers on the internet called Top Coder, and, uh, and maybe Cisco will hire you as a coder to solve one of their technical problems. 
You can fight crime in your community without being part of the police department by doing a mashup of Google Maps against local crime statistics. You can fight um, and to help people survive a hurricane. Katrina, the authorities responded badly. People self-organized using Google Maps and other capability. There'd be a little bullet on the map saying, woman in second floor of house in wheelchair, water eight feet and rising. And she was saved because of that. A new age of participation where the human talent of planet Earth has an opportunity to be brought to bear on innovation, value creation, wealth creation, and oh yeah, on profit too for companies that can figure it out. This is, if I may use that term, a paradigm shift. <laughs> I'm allowed to use that term. I wrote the book, okay? Um, <laughs> When you get one of these, you get a crisis of leadership because these things cause coolness, dislocation, confusion, vested interests fight against change. And leaders of the old are often the last to embrace the new. How can your company find the leadership to make a change like this? Well, final conclusion from our research, in the age of mass collaboration, leadership can come from anywhere. And you may be the CEO of a company, or you may be buried seven levels down, but you, if you will it, can be a leader. Uh, this is a time of, uh, of, of great opportunity, and I thank you so much for your interest uh, uh, in the book, and on behalf of Anthony and New Paradigm, I wish you the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Don. We're not going to give Don even 30 seconds to catch his breath. We're going to ask him some questions. So we've got some questions from the audience. Uh, Don, what might mass collaboration mean for government and democracy? Well, that's a great question um, because we don't exactly have a collaborative model of democracy, if I may uh, say. Uh, le let me stereotype it. I'm a politician, uh, listen to this 30 second sound clip, which in the US, by the way, is a negative ad about something that, as a young person, I sure don't care about. And then go and vote for me and I'll broadcast to you for the next four years. It's a one way broadcast model of democracy. Could we move to a more interactive, engaged model of democracy? And um, the technology has been there to do this for some time. And actually my company worked with the White House and it was the end of the Clinton administration, and we were going to do what we called a digital brainstorm. And uh, Bill uh, Clinton was going to uh, come on Monday morning television. He was going to say, we're going to have a discussion in America for the next two weeks. It's, the topic he chose was the digital divide. How will we close the digital divide in America? And it's going to be broken down by state and by group. There would be a lawmakers group and a private sector and educators and so on. He says... Uh, I've hired uh, thousands of university students that will bring the best ideas to me. I'm going to participate every day. And at the end of two weeks, I don't know what we'll do. But I know that we will have a real discussion. And there will be initiatives catalyzed. And I'm going to learn a lot. And you're going to learn a lot. And this is going to help us take a baby step towards a whole new model of democracy. The old model of democracy was pretty good for the printing press and for television, but kids don't vote today. Um, and it's not because they don't care. They have very strong values. And it's not because they don't know what's going on. They may read the newspaper less, but they still are knowledgeable. People say, oh, they get their news from The Daily Show. Well, that's not true. The Daily Show is not funny unless you know the news. So if we're to reach out to this new generation, and um, if we're to exploit the potential of this new global infrastructure for collaboration, we have an, oppor uh, an opportunity here to make some really big changes in the nature of the, uh, the body politic and, and in, in our lives as citizens, not just as, as units in the economy. Thank you, Don. How do you see our new age of mass collaboration helping us address today's environmental challenges? Well, it already is. Um, th there are heaving communities on the web that are organizing uh, to, uh, to protect the environment. And uh, just on something like global warming, 
if, if any of you have seen um, the uh, the Al, Al Gore movie, he points out that the, the, this bizarre thing that half of the articles in newspapers question whether or not global warming exists, but if you take a random uh, poll of 938 scientists who all have peer-produced articles, zero out of the 938 question that there's, that in any way, that there's a fundamental change that's happening here. So the truth kind of will out about the environment or, or many issues eventually. Now, sometimes it takes a while. But, um, you know, environmental activists, when I was a kid, what could you do if you, if you were... Uh, you know, uh, uh, against racial discrimination as I was, or, you know, uh, uh, against the war in Vietnam, you could put a little poster on a tree or something. Today, at their fingertips, you can reach out to thousands and millions of people in the world and, uh, and organize. And this is becoming a new force uh, uh, for, for social change. Thank you. Uh, did you use mass collaboration in writing this book? <laughs> Uh, thankfully, I can say yes, um, in a bunch of ways. First of all, we didn't like our subtitle, so we went onto the web and we had a 48-hour discussion, help us select a subtitle for the book. And um, uh, in the first 24 hours, we got like 120 subtitle suggestions, and a lot of them were really great. Every book has a title page. This book also has a subtitle page because we printed 15 of our, our favorite subtitles that never made it onto the cover. Now, some of them weren't printable, you know. <laughs> How a couple of guys sucked us into writing a subtitle and made a fortune on a book. But, um, but so that was one thing that we did. The second thing is the, the research, um, there were literally hundreds of people involved in the research uh, behind this book. And if you add it all up, it was actually $9 million uh, worth of research. And, um, and uh, the, uh, the acknowledgement section of the book is very long, much longer than any book that I've uh, written before. And the final thing that we're doing, as I mentioned, is we're inviting the world to co-author the final chapter of the book. And um, th th this will go on for, for years. And we hope that this will become a very significant, important uh, document. We've done it under what's called a commons license, so we don't own it, and we will not make money uh, directly from this. Uh, this is something that exists. It's part of the commons, and it's part of the, the public. And, and I think any of uh, my team that's been working on this will tell you it's quite amazing. People come in, and they just reorganize everything you had. And uh, often what they do is, is very helpful. They ask tough questions about why does the book say this? And Anthony and I are wondering, oops, maybe in the next round we'll just change that formulation a little bit. So if you can be comfortable um, inviting the, 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 the world in to scrutinize you and to participate uh, uh, with you, then um, some very good things uh, can happen. I think the book is a product of that. You've described a big change in the corporation. Will it cease to exist? Will the corporation cease to yeah, exist? Please. No, I hope not. Um, the, uh, the, the, the corporation, for better or for worse, is the institution that we've chosen to create goods and services and value uh, uh, in, in society. And it turns out the other options to that uh, have not been uh, helpful. And I don't think we'll ever get to a world where we're all independent agents. Um, the corporation is also the only vehicle, really, to organize the ownership uh, of wealth. And, and, and it, th this does not mean the companies will become smaller, by the way. If you look at a company like P&G that's harnessed mass collaboration, it's getting bigger, not just in its revenue and its profit, but in terms of the number of employees. And we will always need employees within our corporation. In my company, for example, we need a core of people who we can all complete each other's sentences, and we all sort of understand uh, very deeply what our core intellectual uh, uh, property is. But having said that, there's a whole new opportunity to engage the world in ways that were previously impossible. Well, we have a lot more great questions, but I'll have to cut it out. One more question, Don. How do you ensure accuracy and quality in these communities? Uh, actually, we don't have to do it because the community uh, tends to do it. And it's an amazing thing. Um, 
I actually, Gord, if I can pick on you, I went and, and uh, looked on Wikipedia, and Gord Nixon is on Wikipedia. Now, um, and it's called, a, it's called a stub. So someone has gone there, probably one of the hardcore Wikian types, and they've created a, an accurate description of Gord Nixon, but it's not a complete one. So anyone can go in and change it. So I could go there right after this um, lunch, and I could type in Gord Nixon is the world's leading accordion player. I'm guessing that's not a true statement. Um, so, um, and that would last for a few minutes, but there would be a whole bunch of people all over it. As soon as the world, world's, world's leading comes up, they'll be all over it and correct it. And then there'll be a bunch of accordion players who'll be saying, who the heck is Gordon Nixon? You know? <laughs> Guy doesn't even have a CD. So, uh, and that'll get corrected. And I'll, I'll just end with this funny, funny story. Uh, Mike uh, Dover, who's... Um, who's here and is at New Paradigm. It was about eight months ago. He sent me an email saying, Don, I just went on to Wikipedia and I entered your word, Wikinomics. The, uh, the, uh, the theory and practice of mass collaboration as defined by Don Tapscott and Anthony Williams in their book of the same title. And so I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And I went there and it was gone. And so one of the things about accuracy is you can find out what happened to it. So in the few minutes that it was up there, there was a raging discussion from people from all over the world, I guess. And somebody says, well, this is a neologism. I just Googled this thing and only got 60 hits. That doesn't get into Wikipedia. And somebody else says, well, Tapscott's a credible author and he's come up with these other terms. And, and somebody else says, yeah, but what if his new book is a disaster? I mean, we can't let this in. And they deleted it. <laughs> now, as an author, I was quite annoyed. But as someone who studied, studies these things, I, I was quite impressed. It was probably premature to try and coin a neologism with economics. Now, I was doing uh, some uh, radio interviews over the last week, and uh, the, one of the, I told this story, and the guy said to me, well, are you up there now? And I said, I don't know. I went and looked, and sure enough, Wikinomics is now in Wikipedia. We have no idea who put it there. The definition is not too bad. But if you Google Wikinomics today, you'll get half a million hits. So it's now pretty much a legitimate term that can become part of the vernacular. You know, it's like you put a bacteria into a system and all of a sudden these antibodies get all over it and correct it. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be factual, factually incorrect information at any point in time, but it's an amazing thing how the millions can create something that's as good as and ten times bigger than the one developed by the, the, uh, the Nobel Prize winners. Uh, very interesting time. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don, for being such a great sport. We've got a, a few more really good questions, so we will catch Don after the lunch and post his answers on the website for you. And now I would like to call on Nick Chambers, Vice President of the Canadian Club, to thank Dawn on our behalf. Nick? Thanks, Noella. Ladies and gentlemen, if Dawn Tapscott and Anthony Williams ever adapt Wikonomics for the big screen, I recommend you take your laptop and a wireless card to the theater. I'm sure many of you are itching to get back to your computers inspired by Mr. Tapscott's anecdotes and inspiration. Reading Wikonomics provides a similar experience. One can't help but multitask. Your internet browser or two on the right, Don's book on the left. One of my uh, detours when reading it led me to look up the word change on Wikipedia and then on wiki quotes. There I found the following words written 30 years ago or more by a now deceased American writer named Eric Hoffer. He wrote, in times of profound change, the learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Well, not only are these times of profound change, but the changes are happening right before our eyes, thanks in large part to mass collaboration. Don, you have made a very wise career choice. Your stories and guidance are compelling. I'm confident that what you've discovered through your research is also only the tip of the iceberg. On behalf of everyone here, please accept my sincere thanks 
and wish for continued good fortune. Thank you, Nick. This wraps up today's program, which was broadcast live on Rogers Television and will be rebroadcast in the days to come. You can also see the webcast of the speech by visiting canadianclub.org. Thank you all for coming today. This meeting is now adjourned.